Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Anton Warnchuk in Baltimore. The Israeli assault on Gaza has dominated international headlines for weeks. The Palestinian death toll has surpassed 1,800, with more than 60 Israelis dead. But what's gotten less attention is the role that Gaza's estimated 1.4 trillion cubic natural gas reserves, valued at $4 billion, has played. Now joining us from London to discuss this is Dr. Nafiz Ahmed. His recent piece in The Guardian is titled, IDF's Gaza assault is to control Palestinian gas, avert Israeli energy crisis. Thanks for joining us, Nafiz. Thanks, Anton. So let's start off. What documentary evidence exists that uh, gas, uh, the gas reserves are indeed playing a role here in the latest assault on the Gaza Strip? Well, I mean, obviously, the history of, of this whole issue actually goes back to the, the date that they were actually discovered, which was around 1999 to 2000. Um, and the gas was at that time uh, discovered by uh, the, the BG Group, which is a, a British company. Now, obviously, the Israel-Palestine conflict has gone on much longer than that. But what we're seeing is since the discovery of gas, um, you know, fairly significant gas resources uh, in, in, in Gaza, we've seen that those resources have played an increasing role in determining the course of the conflict. What's happened uh, recently is over the last uh, six, seven years or so, increasingly it seems that Israel, as Israel's energy issues have become more pronounced, its, it's, it's repeated military incursions into Gaza uh, appear to have been linked um, very much to the interest in dominating and exploiting um, the, these offshore reserves in, in, in Gaza. Now, there have been many efforts by Israel to come to some kind of an arrangement um, with its favoured uh, parties, namely the Palestinian Authority in, in the West Bank, uh, run by Fatah, um, and, and, and kind of ride roughshod over Hamas, which is seen as um, an entity that they just simply cannot uh, negotiate with uh, under any circumstances. Now, since Operation Cast Lead, um, it, it's my view um, that the control of the Gazas, the Gaza Marine, where we have these offshore gas resources, has been an increasingly important issue. In 2007, um, the current uh, defense minister, Mosh Yalon, um, wrote an article, a, a, a paper, a policy paper, for the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, where he explicitly uh, called for the need for military action to uproot Hamas in order to begin drilling work to bring these gas, res gas reserves in Gaza to production. And he basically indicated not only that was Hamas an obstacle to um, exploiting these resources, but, it, but even the Palestinian Authority. Effectively, the scenario that he put forward was that if there was any situation in which any of these Palestinian entities were allowed to begin to produce these resources and benefit from them economically, this would be a major strategic threat to Israel and the money, the revenues that they would gain, which have been estimated to be anything from around six to seven billion dollars a year, would end up going to fund uh, the resistance, to fund uh, the, you know, terrorism against Israel. And that would be unacceptable and therefore it would be unacceptable to ever allow uh, the Palestinian entities in this way to exploit these resources. So I think there's two dimensions here. One is basically there is a strategic interest in simply preventing the Palestinians from actually take, uh, using these resources for themselves, for their own benefit, and you know becoming more independent from Israel in that sense and being more viable as an independent entity, independent state. Of course, the other related issue is, is, is really to do with Israel's own energy needs. Now, of course, there have been major discoveries in, uh, you know, of, of, of resources which inside Israeli territory the Leviathan fields, the Tamar fields, which are you know, many, many times larger than what has been discovered um, in, in, in Gaza. However, the difficulty here is, is that over the last few years, despite these discoveries, Israel has faced many bureaucratic, regulatory, and even geophysical hurdles in actually bringing these fields to production. Now, in another article that I wrote for The Ecologist magazine, where I updated uh, my investigation uh, that I had originally done for The Guardian, um, I uh, uncovered some um, 
foreign office, British foreign office files that had been obtained under freedom of information by uh, a think tank based in Washington, D.C. Uh, not many people know about these files, even though they've been published online. Um, and those files show that the British Foreign Office um, was aware and had actually was involved in a plan effectively to, to use Gaza's gas as a cheap stopgap while Israel is trying to bring these fields uh, to production. In other words, in the interim period when we have, you know, these, it could take up to five years to bring the fields to production. You know, what are they going to do in the meantime? They can use this the gas. But the difficulty, again, was Hamas standing in the way um, and the, the, you know, the terms and conditions that Hamas could put and this overall ideology of denying the Palestinians any kind of role in kind of developing their own resources and moving towards an independent trajectory. So in my view, when we piece all this together, it seems clear that Moshe Alon now, at that time when he first wrote that article, he was a former IDF chief of staff. Um, but, you know, now he's actually in, again, in, the, in a senior position in the administration, executing the war plan. It seems clear to me that it's quite, quite likely that he is executing exactly that plan in order to um, fulfill this, this agenda of essentially crushing Hamas um, and gaining some kind of strategic control over Gaza in order that, they, uh, that Israel can, on the one hand, ensure that the Palestinians can't develop this gas and on the other hand, ensure that Israel is able to develop this gas for its own interests. Well, then you, you say that the purpose of this strategically then to control the gas is also to, as you say, avert is the Israeli energy crisis. Can you talk about what the energy crisis that Israel is facing? Well, this, this energy crisis has been referred to in a number of um, you know, standard Israeli business publications, um, although it's not very well known. And that really is to do with um, the problem of high, increasing electricity prices and the inability to bring domestic gas resources to production. Now, all the discoveries that have taken place over the last few years, you have many people in the existing oil and gas industry, especially the Israeli oil and gas industry in the US and British oil and gas industry, kind of hyping it up and talking about how Israel is now going to be a major geopolitical force. It's going to become a net exporter of gas in the region, you know, exporting to Jordan, um, you know, as, as, even as far as Europe, according to some people. However, there was an interesting report that was unearthed by uh, Haaretz, the liberal newspaper in, 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 in Israel, where they discovered that the committee that had been set up to basically develop policy on how much gas should be exported and how much gas should be used domestically had actually received uh, an interesting piece of research uh, that was formally sent to them as part of the committee's uh, process by its two chief scientists of the energy and water ministries. And um, these scientists basically said that they believed that the existing uh, kind of forecasts of production and the existing estimates of how much production could actually increase over the next couple of decades or so were actually vastly overestimated. Um, and in fact, that the quantity of, com of gas that could be brought commercially uh, in, into production was actually much lower. And they believed and they are advocated that it actually Israel sh can, has really only two choices. It can either become a net gas importer, in which case it will not have any gas domestically uh, to, uh, to use for its own needs, or it will have to use its gas domestically for its own needs and, and, and not fulfill these aspirations to be uh, an exporter. So faced with that choice, um, Haaretz reported that this 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 uh, very important document had actually been suppressed. It was not published as part of the committee's official, um, you know, reports. It was left out of the website. And it was only after Haaretz uh, publicised the report that the, the committee published it on the site. So clearly, there was an uh, there was a concern inside the highest levels of the Israeli government that this would basically scupper. Um, their plans to become, you know, a, a major geopolitical force through the, the, the this new kind of energy configuration. So it seems clear to me, based on this assessment, if that assessment is correct, and it seems to me that um, certainly people inside the Israeli administration were worried by it. They saw it as potentially damaging for their reputation, damaging for their uh, potential uh, 
kind of interests and, and, and potential contracts with major companies internationally that were now wanting to invest in Israel. They saw there's something that was dangerous and they need to suppress. And they were worried that, and I, I do think that this, it seems that they were worried that it was true, that this gas would not be enough for Israel to, to, to both export and meet its domestic needs. So they need something as a stopgap. And this is where the Gaza Marine comes in. And according to these FCO files, precisely in this period where we have a gap, where there is a difficulty in bringing these existing Israeli fuels into production, Gaza Marine was, was seen as basically a potential source that could deal with this energy crisis and allow Israel to have a source of energy, a fairly substantive source, while it's bringing these into production. So I, do, I think that it's, it's pretty clear, based on all of this analysis, that this is real, this is a real issue. If we look at what was happening in the last year or so, there were meetings, secret meetings going on between Israeli officials, Netanyahu's own personal uh, negotiator, uh, and uh, uh, representatives of the BG group that basically currently holds the right to Gaza's gas. And interestingly, Palestinian officials, not just Hamas, but even from Fatah, the Palestinian Authority, were excluded from this deal. And this was at the same kind of time when we had Netanyahu giving lip service to the deal, saying that, yes, you know, we want to push forward negotiations with the Palestinians over Gaza's gas. And when Kerry, as part of the peace process, had actually put forward you know, an economic stimulus package. And part of that package was to the development of the Gaza Marine. So we had Netanyahu playing a double game effectively. On the one hand saying, yeah, we want to have diplomatic uh, discussions about the gas and about Gaza and about a, a meaningful two-state solution. And at the same time, in reality, as we now know in hindsight from Kerry officials and, 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 and you know, people involved in the peace process, that actually Netanyahu had no intention, that he deliberately... Torpedoed, torpedoed that peace process because he doesn't want an independent, viable Palestinian state. And simultaneously, um, not allowing Palestinian officials to participate in negotiations involving Gaza's gas. So we look at all of this uh, circumstantial evidence over the last year to two years, it seems very clear that Gaza's energy resources have certainly played a very important role in Israel's strategic considerations in why it's going into Gaza. Not the only role by any means, many and many other factors, but that is a certainly an increasingly important issue. Okay, Nafiz, Ahmed, thanks for ch uh, sharing your recent work with us. Thanks, Samson. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.